In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Paul graciously welcomed all of us this morning to celebrate the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. And as a resident of Massachusetts made some reference to something about Super Bowl, I don't know what that meant. But he did say that we are still in the, in the season of Epiphany and that we don the color of green. The liturgical color of green is a color of hope and expectation. But that doesn't mean that green is the only color that the church celebrates because we're very multicultural. I mean, we like blue, we like orange, we like brown. So you see, we're very welcoming no matter where we are. So, so welcome all of you to this wonderful celebration. We are here for so many reasons. But let me begin my homily by saying that sometimes it's good to get lost. Sometimes it's good to get lost. Now, we've all heard those words before. Maybe they were spoken by an older brother or sister annoyed with our nagging questions. They told us, get lost. Maybe they were said by a group of the neighborhood kids that we very much wanted to join in in their sports team, but they didn't want us. They told us, get lost. Worse yet, they may have been spoken to us by that significant person we'd always considered a friend. And of course, lastly, in our relationships with our spouses, our partners, our significant others, we know that they would never let it tell us to get lost. I mean, when would a husband or wife say, you know, honey, just get lost for the day so that I can do something? But that's still a possibility. Anyway, these two little words, get lost, are very painful. They cut us to the core. They burn. They carry the scourging tone of rejection. They mean, get away from here, or worse, get away from me. Now, our reading from St. Mark's Gospel this morning tells of a time when Jesus got lost. This experience belongs to his adult life. In the morning, while it was still very dark, Jesus got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Simon and his companions hunted for him, and when they had found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. Now, this is a different kind of getting lost, one which Jesus had deliberately chosen. Now, this little incident caps off an incredibly busy Sabbath for Jesus. The day begins with him teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. There he's interrupted by a demon-possessed man whom he heals. He moves with his entourage next to the house of Simon and Andrew. And there they discover that Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed. Jesus heals her too. Now, words of these wonders travel very, very fast. And by evening, the whole city seems to be camped out at Simon's front door, eager to bring their sick and infirm to Jesus to be healed. Jesus treats everyone who comes to him. Jesus turns no one away, never asks questions, turns no one away. And he's still at it, well past sunset. So by the time this incredible day is over, he is exhausted and he settles down to a well-earned night's rest. But then morning comes and Jesus has disappeared. Getting up long before his disciples have stopped snoring, Jesus has gone out and gotten himself lost. Later they find him in a deserted place, in a place of prayer. He's on his knees. You can almost hear the annoyance in Simon's voice as he informs his master, everyone is searching for you. Like, what are you doing here on your knees praying? Well, Simon could not have known what a profound truth 
he just spoke. Because two millennia later, many, many people in the world, even though they wouldn't describe it in as many words, are still searching for Jesus. They are still searching for God. They are still searching for that icon of love and peace that they need to grab onto in their lives, in their relationships, in society, and in the nation. Still searching today. But where few find him is in that deserted place, in that desert place, in that place of prayer. And you know, that's because most of us and most of the world, in searching for Jesus, in searching for a savior, in searching for that great comforter, focuses on places of action, on places of striving, on places of doing. And that's because we are engaged in so much doing and so much action, in so many activities. We hardly expect to find him in a place of being, in a place of solitude, in a place of prayer. Because solitude frightens us. We don't like lonely places. We're afraid of the unknown in life. We're afraid of those questions we just can't get answers for. And so we tend to stay away from desert places in our life and in society. But this picture this morning of Jesus spending a quiet time in prayer, even though it doesn't seem to make sense, because when we look at that image that most of us have of our God, we realize that this God must be just like us. Many times we recreate the God we want to see in life, not the God that is really there for us. But because we're busy with jobs and kids and grandkids, taxi services, taking people back and forth to school and music lessons and sports teams, every day we're like taxi services. We get involved in meetings, even at church, volunteerism, more volunteerism, and so forth. And so consequently, we look for a God who is even busier than we are because we know that if this God is a God, then he can do that busyness thing even better than we can. The Greek word eremos that St. Mark uses here in the gospel means lonely and deserted. It is where our English word hermit comes from. A hermit is one who inhabits lonely places for the purpose of finding true <coughs> enlightenment. So if Jesus needs to get lost, then so do we. Now when you think about it, does it seem remarkable that Jesus, God's son, had to spend time in prayer? I mean, after all, Jesus is God. Why would God need time to spend in prayer? Clearly to St. Mark, Jesus needs prayer. He may be the son of God, but Mark doesn't portray him, not in this life anyway, as all-sufficient or even all-knowing. The Jesus of Mark's gospel is very human. If you have taken Father Paul's course in the gospel of Mark, you will know that it is confirmed in that theology that we need to know about the gospel. And Father Paul makes it so incredibly clear because he is such a good gospel scholar. The Jesus of Mark's gospel is very human. He has the same needs that we do. Food, friends, communion with God, love, and most importantly, rest. One of Jesus' favorite tools for maintaining a vibrant relationship with God, his Father, was to get lost. And again, we're no different. We may try to fool ourselves into thinking that the way of holiness is the way of activity, of being busy all the time, but we'd be wrong. You know, activity has its place, but unless it's grounded in a relationship with God, Everything we do, all our work and even all our play, meaningful as it might be, can only lead to burnout. And we just can't do it alone. And that's the way God looks on us as well. 
You know, we'd love to imagine we're completely self-sufficient in this life. Many of us pride ourselves in being so well organized that we don't need anybody else, especially not God. But you know, we're only fooling ourselves. No matter how gifted you are, how intelligent you are, how self-disciplined you are, we may be together, priest and people alike. There always comes a time when our resources run out. And that's, and that's when we have to turn to no one but God. The problem is, this is not the sort of desert place or lonely place or time off that most people in our culture look forward to because this is not trading the activities of work for another round of activities on weekends, most of which are recreational. I mean, what do we do for rest and relaxation? We swap the everyday commute during the week for a Saturday of driving the kids to their soccer game or to whatever, and we say, well, this must be restorative. This is what freedom is like. This is what time off is like. But that's not the time off that Jesus is telling us to take. It's not the reason Jesus went to that lonely place. According to Christian writer Philip Yancey, this spiritual discipline is expressed in an ancient monastic tradition called statio. And what this means simply is this. Stopping one thing before beginning another. Rather than multitasking and heaping all kinds of stuff on our lives and our kids and our relationships and our mar marriages and society and our nation and politics and sports and everything else, rather than doing all that multitasking, rather than rushing from one task to the next, pause for a moment and recognize that there is time between time and recognize that time between time. Before calling on the phone, pause and think about the conversation and the person on the other end. After reading from a book, pause and think back through what you have learned and how you might have been moved. After watching a television show, pause and ask, what did it contribute to your life? And before reading the Bible, pause and ask for a spirit of attention, a spirit of discernment. Do this often enough, and even all your mechanical acts will become very conscious and very mindful and have a great impact on your life. There's an ancient Greek proverb that says, you will break the bow if it is always bent. You will break the bow if it is always bent. Getting lost every once in a while was Jesus' way of making sure that his bow would not break and tragedy would not happen. May you, too, give yourself permission to unstring the bow of your life. May you, too, give yourself permission to get lost and to find God.